working with Asian American and Pacific Islander clients, how can we avoid labeling their relationships as enmeshed? When is it enmeshment and when is it a fluid state of interdependence? Is setting boundaries an appropriate therapy intervention? And what does that even look like in an AAPI context? How can we utilize strategies from acceptance and commitment to therapy to help AAPI clients explore and navigate boundaries in relationships? Welcome to People of Color in Psychology, the show that explores mental health topics specific to culture, diversity, and communities of color. I am your host, Jack Zen. As part of our AAPI series highlighting the work of AAPI psychologists, today we are joined by Dr. Corday. She is an Asian Indian multilingual psychologist who provides therapy and consultation services in English, Hindi, and Marathi. Dr. Corday is licensed in Texas and California and is a board member of San Francisco Psychological Association. Dr. Corday provides therapy across the lifespan treating depression, anxiety, panic attacks, OCD, and postpartum anxiety and depression. Her therapeutic interventions include cognitive behavioral therapy, art therapy, mindfulness, psychodynamic techniques, and acceptance and commitment therapy. She has found that ACT offers more flexibility in working with South Asian clients in her clinical practice. In addition to her clinical work, Dr. Corday has a consulting practice that emphasizes interpersonal effectiveness, conflict resolution, conflict management, building resilience, and personal and professional growth. She has published in the area of group and consulting topics such as brainstorming and perspective taking. Today, Dr. Corday will be discussing topics around boundaries and boundary setting in the AAPI population. Dr. Corday, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Sun. I'd love to know more about your journey, more about you and how you got into this work. Yeah, so I got interested in psychology when I was in 12th grade, I think, uh, when I first took my class, my very first class in psychology. And I was absolutely fascinated by the topics that we covered. And I think as a child growing up too, I was always one to question why. Why is somebody behaving this way? Why did they say that? Why did they you know, act like that? And it always was something that I wanted to find out more about. What was something that was pushing someone to say something or behave in a certain way? And I think that really was fueled when I started taking the classes. And I, I knew the first time I took that class that this is what I wanted to do. And so I never looked back from that point on. And I decided to pursue psychology all the way through. Through my undergrad, I majored in psychology. I pursued my master's in psychology and eventually my MS and PhD in psychology. Wow. So it sounds like early on, you knew this was the track that you're going to take. Yes. Yes. Okay. Wow. So something I have to ask, because this is something that uh, a lot of the AAPI communities face, which is you know, we're told doctor, lawyers, engineer, right, the the safe careers. What was that like knowing at such an early age, I mean, 12th grade that, yeah, this is the path I want to take? It was really interesting because up until that point, I wanted to do so many things and I wanted to not do so many things. As a child, seven or eight years old, I dreamt about being an astronaut or astronomer or a scientist or all kinds of things. And all of these things still fascinate me. I could still look at the stars all night. You know, I'd still feel like, oh, maybe I should go learn more about it, but I don't have the time. But I feel like when I started learning psychology, something just clicked for me. It felt like more of a calling. It felt like this is more of my sole purpose to continue on this path. Luckily for me, my parents were flexible with me sort of exploring what my options were. Schooling was a little bit different back in India. You had to choose whether you were going to go to the science, the arts, or the commerce. There were three categories that you had to choose. You couldn't try something from everything. And you had to choose when you were 15. If you chose wrong, you would have to go back and finish 11th and 12th grade in a different field, which I haven't heard of many people doing that 
ever in India. So at that time, you know, I was 15 and I didn't know better. And so I decided, I saw my older sister completing her 11th and 12th in science. And I saw how much work it was. And I was like, oh my God, you have so many things. I don't know if this is what I want to do. This is too much. And then commerce was not my, my thing. I never felt a colleague. So I was like, let's explore the arts and see what happens. And when I did, the first class I took was psychology as part of the arts. And that was it. And I never looked back. So it was a little bit of me being a lost adolescent when I started my journey and a little bit of fate and a little bit of flexibility on my parents' part too. I do believe, I think I was traveling when we had to do our final forms for the classes and selections and things. And my mom had filled out my forms and she had picked psychology as one of the subjects. So I guess she always, you know, knew. So it was, it was fate. It was my mom. It Way was... to go, mom. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And okay. So it sounds like you had high school up to high school in India. When did you come to the States? So I came to the States after I got married. That was after I finished my master's and after I had already practiced in India for a couple of years. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think you and I spoke about some of the admissions criteria or sort of the Eurocentric view of, you know, mm -hmm. what's competitive and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Do we want to get into that? <laughs> <laughs> I can briefly touch on it. So my, no. my education journey has been very different than I think most people here in the States. I did most of my primary elementary schooling in Saudi Arabia because we lived there as a family. My father used to work in Saudi Arabia for Shell at the time. And so up until sixth grade, I grew up there in an Indian school, but it was a different country, different culture. Then moved to India, did my middle school, high school, bachelor's, master's in India, and then worked in India for a couple of years, and then got married and then came to the States to do my MS and PhD. But the transitions, I think the hardest one was probably coming in terms of the education system was coming from India to the States because trying to figure out translations between the two <laughs> education systems and trying to explain what one system meant to another system, I think was the most difficult part of the process. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I have been some thoughts when you're saying the translation of the different systems. Can mm -hmm. you give me some examples? Because, yeah, I'm actually just fascinated. You did masters in India mm -hmm. in psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did that transfer over to a PhD here in the States? I'm not sure it did because I ended up doing my MS PhD again here. So I did a second master's here. Oh my gosh. So they didn't, they discounted the entire. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, so that's a little bit about your journey here in terms of your exposure to psychology. So one of the topics that we really want to highlight today is boundary settings because many of us see posts on social media, therapists advocating setting boundaries, setting boundaries. And there's also this myth of enmeshment, this sort of uh, negative connotation of AAPI families engaging in this enmeshment type of relationship. Share with us your thoughts and your clinical experience of what all that means for you and things that we should be looking into. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the reasons why this topic was top of mind when we talked is because I had recently heard some friends, non-therapist friends, engaging in conversations about looking for a therapist and one warning the other about, you know, be careful who you pick because, you know, they'll tell you to do something or like cut somebody off and then you're going to have more problems than you asked for. And it's not going to be related to what you came to them to begin with. So that kind of got me thinking, I'm like, you know, as a therapist, I, I trust my fellow clinicians also to, you know, make the right kind of recommendations, but also not offer, you know, advice or solutions. But I see that there is a disconnect in completely understanding what it means to set a boundary in an AAPI community or in the culture. When I see if people of our community go through these posts or read these things, the first look on their face is fright. It's like, oh my God, like, I cannot imagine saying this to my parent or to my sibling or to another family member. I cannot imagine, you know, 
standing up and disagreeing or saying that I don't want to speak to them anymore. Like This would be devastating. And in truth, it would be devastating because it is such a big part of our community to be interdependent on each other, to help each other through difficult situations, that it is not a feasible option to come in and say, well, you just need to not involve them in your life anymore, or you just need to not, you know, tell them anything anymore. Like, those are not necessarily feasible options that work for a community. The reason behind it, I think, is the disconnect where people that are not from API communities don't necessarily understand all the positives that come with being part of that interdependent community. You don't understand what is at stake when you set the boundary, when you're choosing to lose a relationship or certain relationships, you're not thinking about the loss that comes with it. It's not just that relationship. It is the support. It is the emotional support, the physical presence, the financial support. A lot of the times that comes as part of the community that is not necessarily happening outside of the API community. And so that loss is way bigger than simply grieving a single relationship. It is grieving an entire community. And that is something that I think is important for us as therapists to understand and acknowledge and also to help the client fully understand the expanse of what they're dealing with when they're thinking about setting a boundary so they can make a more conscious choice or figure out more creative ways to set boundaries of protecting yourself without necessarily needing to cut everything off. It's not so black and white. Yeah, so I think that is a very clear example of, hey, we have, say, a toxic relationship. We we got to cut them out. And even if we were to pursue that route, you're highlighting that, well, even if we were to take that path, there's such interconnected communities. If I cut my relationship, say, with my, my grandparents or whoever, I'm also cutting a part of that community that I am involved with because grandma, grandpa is going to share some information with the community. It's going to come back. So it's all interrelated. So that's more clear, also broadening our perspective. Now, can you share with us some of the more gray nuanced ways in which even when we talk about setting boundaries, like saying no, or <laughs> how might we navigate that in the AAPI community? Absolutely. So I think the first step is making sure that we understand what is at stake for the client, right, when we're setting a boundary, and then helping the client fully see the picture. What comes with setting a boundary? What comes with saying no? What kind of retaliation or what kind of reactions are we going to get if we try and stand up for ourselves? And making sure that we're prepping them to deal with those things even before we set the boundary. Like what happens if you say this and then this reaction happens? What if they're upset with you? What if they don't agree with you? What if they tell you you're never going to have my approval? How are we going to cope with these things? And then based on that, that will automatically lead us to more flexible choices on what this boundary looks like. So some examples sometimes can be in a very difficult relationship. Let's say you've never had the chance to speak your mind. You've never been asked your opinion. You've never been, you know, asked what you can do. You've only been told what you need to do. And that was that. That was your duty. That was your responsibility. Feeling like you want to share your opinion might feel like a burden, but it goes deeper than that because sometimes feeling like you even have an opinion feels like a burden. Forget about speaking it. You're not allowed to have an opinion. You've never thought about having an opinion. It's just something we grew up with, right? So sometimes the, the boundaries can be so deep within that the boundary setting needs to start a lot more inside than on the outside to even get to the point to be like, okay, I do still have an opinion. I can choose if I choose to state this opinion or not, to share with this person or not, but I still get to have an opinion. And that boundary setting in itself can be just so eye-opening for so many folks that have been had the chance to do that. So in so many ways, it can be really subtle. It can be being able to listen to somebody rant, but having our own internal filters and choosing what we let in and choosing what we don't let in without needing to argue, without needing to talk back, without needing to, you know, get into an argument about how you've never understood me or how, you know, you won't ever understand me. 
part of setting realistic expectations. Do we want to argue with our 60, 70, 80 year old parents and get them to change at this age? Is that a realistic option? Or do we try and take what we can, set boundaries in terms of what we're taking in with whatever we're being given and move forward with what we want and what resonates, what is in more line and more, more in line with our values instead. So with our community, I think starting that boundary setting work on the inside is a lot more important and a better place to start than stating boundaries on the outside until we're ready to get there. It's a slow process. It doesn't happen black or white overnight. You know, that is so nuanced and deep. I've never even thought about it in those terms to be able to verbalize how just formulating an opinion in itself is an act of setting some boundary from within. Mm -hmm. And it's so fluid just thinking about this internal flow of I'm setting a boundary within myself. I'm understanding what am I taking in and what do I want to do with that information? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean that I'm even having this opinion? Because I've been told you're not allowed to have an opinion. Right. So can, can you maybe describe some potential cultural nuances about that? So, for example, when you're dealing with a person in, author in an authority position, right? A teacher, for example, a guru, you're dealing with a parent. There are certain expectations that you're supposed to do something a certain way. You're supposed to, let's say, you know, keep your room a certain way, or you're supposed to like having things a certain way. But you'd never have the opportunity to reflect on, do I actually like things this way? Do I want to? Like, is this still in line with my values as who I am today and who I am becoming? Or is this something I'm doing because I'm supposed to be doing? Now, that doesn't mean we rebel against everything, right? There are things that we do that we're supposed to do that we may not like, right? Like brushing our teeth as a seven-year-old. We don't want to brush our teeth, but we still have to. So there are things that we want to look at in terms of more grayscale rather than so much in the black and white and start questioning ourselves as adults and think about hey all these things that i've done have i done them because i'm supposed to or am i continuing to do them because they make sense to me and i agree and they resonate with me or i've actually never had the chance to stop and think about what i really want right how do i talk to my children what are my expectations from my children? Are they supposed to, you know, listen to me regardless of what I say? Are they supposed to ask me or tell me that they agree or they don't agree? Is that allowed for my children to do? Was I allowed to do that? And going from there, right, just working our way inward, I think, and here's where I think ACT can really be helpful. Trying to unpack the values that we were given as kids by our parents, by our communities, our cultures, our experiences, and trying to separate that from who we are today and which one of these we still like, want to keep, which one of these have changed, which one of these are no longer us. And how do we go about even setting the boundaries with those values? How do we go in and figure out where do I want to implement this? To what extent do I want to implement this? Where does this fall in my life? And how does it guide me to where I want to go in the future? Mm -hmm. When we talk about enmeshment, I feel like there's more branding of it as bad, as evil, uh, as wrong, versus actually looking at our boundaries in a more curious way, actually trying to understand what kinds of boundaries are helpful to us, what kinds of boundaries that we don't have maybe have got in the way of expressing who we are, expressing our truth, feeling comfortable in our own skin, feeling happy, feeling motivated, moving towards what makes us happy. And enmeshment, I think, is such a loaded term. There's some truth to it, right? But I think it gets overused a lot in all kinds of situations where people don't understand that there are closer boundaries or less firm or more, a little bit more blurry boundaries. Enmeshment does happen a lot. And I think it does happen more in some of our communities that are more tight knit. But to me, when I think of enmeshment, I'm thinking about, you know, conversations that people will have about, you know, you need to not do this or you need to not make this decision because it's going to affect my health. 
you know, I'm going to have high blood pressure. You're going to give me a heart attack or I'm going to, you know, go into depression because you're not ending this relationship or you're ending this relationship or you're not going to become a doctor or a lawyer. And so I'm going to, you know, be ruined in my social circle. And now I have blood pressure problems because I can't face my heart like that. Yes. There's where we start to blur a little bit more and we're telling the other person to take responsibility for our emotions. That's more enmeshment. But feeling dependent, wanting to care for someone, wanting to protect someone, I don't think is enmeshment. I was reading an article and I think one of the things that the article said is enmeshment is when you feel the need to fix the problem when you feel the need to solve the problem and it's like mm, i don't know i don't know of any parent api or not that doesn't want to fix their kids problems or solve their kids problems right it's a natural animal instinct even right to protect your young so is that really enmeshment or is it just wanting to protect your young as part of a primal instinct that we have but how far do we take that are we when we're talking about your decisions have an impact on my physical, mental health, on my well-being. Are we talking about protecting the child or are we talking about protecting us? I think that's where the confusion happens. And as a child, we don't know what is what. We're just doing what we're told and we couldn't possibly take responsibility for our parents' health or, or you know, other family members' health. So that distinction, I think, also sometimes need to be needs to be explained to clinicians as well, but also our clients is what are we looking at? Is this enmeshment or is this just needing a little bit more boundary setting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Enmeshment in many ways is like nowadays when we use it, it almost shuts off a lot of conversations rather mm -hmm. than, as you were saying, how do we maintain a state of curiosity and observation as opposed to like, well, we're not even questioning it. We haven't mm -hmm. reached that point. We're just observing for now. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about your practice, what you're doing now and some of the work. Yes. So right now, my private practice has evolved more into growth work, more into spiritual work. I still work with a lot of clients that are dealing with anxiety or depression or OCD or grief, postpartum issues. But it is angled more toward the direction of what is all of this you know, teaching us? Where is this going? How do we use this to continue growing as a person? What can we take from these experiences? How do we cope with the day-to-day, -day, but also see if we can go beyond that? How do we go beyond survival through these difficult experiences that we have? And how do we move towards really living our life, living our life in line with our values, living our life in line with whether we want to call it our soul path, our calling, but doing things that continue to energize us, motivate us, while taking along all the things that might feel like they're dragging us down, the sadness, the anxiety, but trying to have a conversation with the sadness, with the anxiety, with the depression, with the grief, and trying to understand what it is that they're trying to tell us. They're here for a reason, right? Our emotions serve a purpose. A lot of the times the focus can be on how do I get rid of the anxiety? How do I get rid of the depression? Tell me what to do so I can be cured, right? But I think if we listen to them, if, they, if we take the envelope with the message that they're trying to hand to us, I think they go away on their own. It's about trying to talk to them and figure out why is depression here? Well, because this thing happened and this was really difficult. And we need to sit with that and allow ourselves to feel the sadness or the grief or the anger or the frustration. And that's where the healing will then come from. Why is anxiety here? Because anxiety is worried that we're going to do this and then this is going to cause us pain and that's going to happen and then that's going to happen. Okay, we can talk to anxiety. We listen to anxiety. And then we decide if what anxiety is saying is in line with our value. Is it telling us to never go out again? Is it telling us to never go for a job interview or never make friends? Is that in line with our values? Do we never want to have a job? Do we never want to have friends? Hmm, maybe not. But instead of shunning anxiety, can we tell anxiety, you know what? Thank you. 
I appreciate you bringing these concerns to light. I appreciate you looking out for me, but I think this is important for me and I wanna do it anyway. So come along, let's do this. Let's go together and do this and let's see what happens. Let's see if it's gonna be okay. And if it's not, what are the tools that I have that can help me cope? Can I trust my resilience to deal with a consequence that might not go as expected? So my practice really has shifted to focus more on our symptoms as messengers, as uh, pieces of really valuable information that we might not have access to had we not had the time to stop or break down or you know experience these emotions so intensely we wouldn't have stopped to listen to them in our busy lives yeah that that's amazing metaphor that our emotions or our symptoms our diagnoses they're mm -hmm. messengers they're mm -hmm. telling us something informative mm -hmm. yeah yeah now this is another question that i ask as a person of color can you share with me some of the challenges you faced and how you overcame them so I think the biggest challenge that I faced was being a person of color and being an immigrant and trying to move to this country while wanting to pursue my path in psychology and wanting to continue practicing. I was practicing when I was in India, but as an immigrant, when you come to the country, especially as a dependent with somebody else, as a, as a spouse, there are so many visa restrictions that you're not allowed to do pretty much anything. <laughs> you can't work. You can't study full time. You can't. Wait, what? Uh, you can't even study full time? Not on the dependent visa. No, you can. You'll have to change your visa status to study full time, which requires, you know, more applications, going back to your home country, getting the new visa stamped, which is all the things I had to do as part of getting back into school. And then you graduate, you go through an MS PhD program, you know, you get your visas, you graduate, and then comes work. And then trying to figure out how you're gonna work in the field because in our field, even though there are so few professionals, there's zero sponsorship happening in most places. Nobody wants to sponsor a work visa for a therapist, not even a major hospital. I am yet to find a hospital that is wanting to sponsor work visas. There are far and few in between that will be able to do that. So if you're not sponsored to work, you can't work. You can't set up a private practice because you don't have the permits, the visa status to set up a private practice. You can only do that on a green card. And so there are all these restrictions and hurdles and hoops that you jump through as a person of color, as an immigrant trying to, you know, explain to, to immigration that I am doing this to help the population of this country right now because I am here. And all these hurdles are not helping me or the population of this country to access more mental health care that we so desperately need and especially need more people of color, more AAPI clinicians. If we are not able to get them in the system, how do we get them to the people? It is a big hurdle, but unfortunately we don't have good answers yet. It is a long, long, long arduous journey that a lot of people will give up on because financial reasons you know family reasons you can't you can't sustain it for very long if you don't have the right supports in place wow that i didn't even realize that because you know uh, i immigrated much earlier i mm -hmm. think i came here to the states when i was about five or six so i wasn't you know like practicing i didn't realize you were already practicing in india mm -hmm. and then suddenly have that essentially not given that opportunity yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It makes no sense. Also, the idea of, I mean, school education really should be available, you know, and to, oh, wow, I can't even, st ah. Yeah, you can do part time on a dependent visa. You can go to like community college part time. But if you choose to become a full time student, you've got to change your visa status again. Well, I am glad you persisted because as you're saying, and it is correct. We need more AAPI mental health providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is there any final thoughts, messages you'd like to share with us? Yes, I'd actually like to read out a poem from my favorite author, Khalil Gibran. He's a Sufi poet, and this is from his book, 
the prophet. This was first published in 1923. And I'd like to read one of his poems on children and our relationships. And I feel it's relevant to our discussion on enmeshment and boundaries. You are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life not, goes not backwards, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer seeks the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves the bow that is stable. Wow, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and how can listeners find you? So you can find me on Psychology Today as Dr. Runa Corday. You can find me on my website, humanpsychotherapy.com. And I also have an Instagram account by the same name, Human Psychotherapy. Okay. Well, Dr. Corday, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Seth. A huge thank you to our listeners. If you like what you've heard, please share and subscribe to our podcast, People of Color in Psychology. 